What's up, everybody? It's the Alex Leak and Friends NFL Podcast, back for another week. I'm your host, Alex Leak. We got Dustin on the show, as always. Good to have you, Dustin. Yeah, hey, what's up, bro? Another week. Man, a crazy week, and uh, I can't wait to talk about it. So much, uh, you know, crazy stuff went down, and then it all is meaningful, too. This is part of the year we get into December, and every win and loss affects playoff speeds and uh, you know so it's storylines everywhere this time of year absolutely so let's start it out with thursday night uh we had the eight and three bills going to foxborough to take on the six and five patriots i picked the patriots to win this because based on the way they played against minnesota uh you know in minnesota on thanksgiving i thought the patriots belichick would have them ready to go and they would perform better but they only put up 10 points at home and the Bills get the win. But most importantly, bro, that Patriots offense just looks like non-existent. You know what I mean? Yeah, I agree. And what do you think is the biggest reason? I mean, we talked about this offseason how they didn't have an offensive coordinator. And everyone that knows football can tell you that Matt Patricia should not be calling the offensive plays, right? Yeah, absolutely. He's a defensive guy and always has been. Yeah, so it makes zero sense. Do you think Mac Jones is partially to blame? Is there anything else to blame? Is it we- lack of weapons, Mac Jones not being the guy? What do you think? Well, to me, in my opinion, it's it's a variety of things when it comes down you know, to an offense. It's not only the quarterback, but it's the head coach. It's the offensive coordinator, you know, um, Again, lack of weapons. I mean, it, it could be many things. But to me, you know, if I was Mac Jones, I'd be wanting to play well because looking over my shoulder, Bailey Zappi's right there. Yeah. Um, and he was visibly frustrated uh, at the end of that game. You could see him yelling towards, like, Patricia and the coaches. He was uh, – it looked like he was saying, throw the fucking ball. The fucking quick game sucked. And if you remember when Tom Brady was there, the Patriots thrived off the quick game. And even in Tampa Bay, Brady has always thrived off the quick game, you know? Absolutely. And, you know, my thing is, why hasn't Belichick stepped in and said, okay, for the rest of the season, we got playoffs on the line. I'm going to step in and call plays. I don't know. Uh, There was some rumors that Belichick would call offensive plays, and I kind of wanted to see it. I mean, I would trust Belichick to call offensive plays way more than I would trust Matt Patricia, you know. Um, But I think the offense being run doesn't fit the skill set of Mac Jones, you know, and he's talking about the quick game sucks. He doesn't want to run that. I don't think they have necessarily the best weapons. They did add Devontae Parker. But they're throwing a lot to, you know, Nelson Aguilar, guys like that. And really, the biggest weapon, the home run threat, is a rookie corner. And that's Marcus Jones, who had the big uh, first career NFL catch, goes for a 48-yard touchdown. Do you see that play? Yeah, that was pretty nice. Um, Good for him. I mean, you know, coming in and playing both sides of the ball. Yeah, I mean, they're – to his credit, Bill Belichick's being creative in that way. You know, he's like, look, we don't have a home run threat on offense. Let's bring in Marcus Jones, who, if you remember, had the game-winning punt return against the Jets for a touchdown. And, boy, does he got legs, man. He's fast. Yeah. He's a – you know, for a third-round pick out of Houston, he's balling. And I'd like to see him used more in the offensive game. Um, How about kicker Nick Folk? Missing a 48-yard field goal to end the first half, and it hits the crossbar. I didn't know that NFL kickers could hit the crossbar from 48. Like, that is a weak leg, don't you think? Yeah, I mean, maybe he just didn't get enough into it because I've seen him make, you know, more than that before. So, Or maybe it was windy or something, but I was very surprised to see a 48-yard field goal hit the crossbar. Yeah, I agree. That's uh, something that probably shouldn't happen. Yeah. So the Patriots fall to 6-6, six and six, last place in the division. I mean, I think they could pass the Jets, but it's likely looking like the Patriots might miss the playoffs unless they turn it around in a hurry, don't you think? Yeah. Um, 
that division is going to be hard to win because you got two or three teams above you that are playing some decent ball. Yeah, so the Patriots go to Arizona to take on the Cardinals on Monday night. I expect Kyler to play. You know, Cliff Kingsbury is coaching for his job. Um, D Hop, Hollywood Brown, guys like that. I'm still, I'm going to take the Patriots to get that win in Arizona. So I don't think the Patriots are dead and buried yet, but their backs are definitely up against the wall. Do you think the Patriots can go into Arizona on Monday night and get a big win? I do. I yeah. New England to win that game. Yeah, the Cardinals are just, they're terrible, right? Yeah, they have a lot that they have to, you know, focus on and fix before we. I can even consider them to be anywhere near the, the even the middle of the league. And that's damning because they have a lot of talent. When you talk about D-Hop and Hollywood Brown and, and Robbie Anderson and Kyler Murray, so... Um, let's talk. Let's we gotta talk about the Bills. You know they get a big win on the road in Foxborough. Um, so a statement win. You know they win it by double digits, uh, pretty easily. And uh, thanks. You know they should be thanking the Chiefs and the Dolphins who lost this week. Now the Bills have the number one seed in the AFC again. It's gonna be a dog fight down to the the last week, but. Big week for the Bills to get back to the number one seed. Yeah. I mean, you know, they need to get up there and hold it just because that's a wild, wild um, division there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do you see Josh Allen throwing a touchdown while he was midair going out of bounds? I did not see that. I, I watched the highlights. I'm trying to figure out how that was not on there. Yeah, I'm, I don't know. It was probably on there. But, yeah, he gets shoved uh, to the sideline, and he jumps and slings it while midair for a touchdown. Pretty impressive. Uh, you know, Josh Allen at this point, what can't he do, right? He can run it at you, and he can make every throw, you know. Uh, he was your, what, preseason pick to win the MVP. Do you think he gets the award? At this point, I don't because, I mean, he has, like, you know, 11 picks on the season. And due to how great guys like Burrow and Jalen Hurts are playing, I don't think yeah. he gets it. Yeah, and he's playing through that elbow injury. And, man, he didn't look like he had an elbow injury on Thursday night. So maybe it's not as much of a concern as I thought. He looked bad on Thanksgiving up until the final drive. He didn't. He looked pretty good against New England. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, man, Josh Allen is always going to be a warrior, bro. No matter what the injury is, he's always going to try to step up and have, help his team win. Yeah. So the Bills get to nine and three. They host the Jets on Sunday. The Jets are actually looking for the sweep. They won in New York the first meeting of the season. The Bills can't get swept. You know, every win is meaningful the rest of the season. You think they beat the Jets and get to 10-3? and three? I do. And I think Mike White is going to start that. At that point, if Mike White loses two straight, loses to the Bills, do you bench Mike White and go back to Zach Wilson? I mean, I would have already been with Zach Wilson no matter what the outcome was just because you know my stance. I feel like he gives uh, uh, the Jets the best chance to win. And we'll talk about it more here in a second, but I think people fell for the fool's gold when Mike White had such a good game against the Bears, who are a really bad defense, and he struggled at times against Minnesota. You know what I mean? And I think mm -hmm. he'll struggle in Buffalo. Um, let's go to Steelers-Falcons on Sunday. The 4-7 and seven Steelers at the 5-7 and seven Falcons. You know, the Steelers all but eliminated, you know, um, just trying to evaluate talent at this point, see what Kenny Pickett's got. The Falcons are playing, you know, still alive for the playoffs. So I figured Atlanta would come out with more urgency, and they absolutely didn't. The Steelers led 19-6 to and hang on to win 19-16 to in Atlanta. Uh, Steelers safety Minka Fitzpatrick with the game-ending interception. Um, you know, the Falcons fall to five and eight. I thought they were better. I thought they were going to put up more of a fight. Obviously not. They, they lost Kyle Pitts. 
for the season with a torn MCL, I think we can go ahead and bury the Falcons, huh? Yeah, um, unfortunately, because nobody wanted to see Mariota su- succeed there more than I did, you know, and because yeah. I really thought that this was his second chance, you know, to rejuvenate and bring back Atlanta a little bit, even if it meant getting them into a wild card. But unfortunately, it didn't happen. Yeah, I mean, you know, you're playing in a bad division. You know, the Bucks are leading that division. There's no reason, you know, you can't, I don't know. But we also were talking about the Falcons going 3-14 and 14 or 4-13 and 13 in preseason. So I think you could consider this a successful year. But Falcon fans aren't going to see it that way, you know. Yeah, I agree. And, I mean, we did have them doing that, but was that pre, pre-Mariota or was that even after? No, they got- that was Mariota was there. I mean, okay. you might not have been as down on him. I was. I didn't think Mariota was an NFL starter. I thought he was a good backup. I still do. And uh, so when your starter is a good backup, I'm not going to pick you to win many games. And I just didn't think they had a lot of talent. You know, outside of Kyle Pitts and Drake London, who do you have? You're throwing routes to Zacchaeus, you know? Yeah. Um, how big of a loss is it? I, You know, it's not a huge loss for the Falcons because Kyle Pitts hasn't been balling out the way we thought he would. But it sucks for Kyle Pitts. Being a young star prospect and suffering a torn MCL, you know, that's a tough injury for him. Yeah, it's uh, anytime that you tear a knee, man, it's, it, it really sucks. Yep. Um, Kenny Pickett, you know, not playing too bad. Combines for 200-plus yards, one touchdown, no turnovers. Some drama in Pittsburgh, though. Rookie wide receiver George Pickens, if you remember in the pre-draft evaluation, the reason he fell a little bit was because of character concerns or locker room chemistry or, be, you know, being an issue. And uh, the rookie reportedly unhappy with a lack of targets and seen yelling, throw me the fucking ball. Um, I love Pickens' talent. I think you do too. But do you think he needs to calm down a little bit and uh, and be a little more patient? I do. And, I mean, you know, he's only a, a rookie. But at the same time, hey, if you're open, get him the ball, you know. Yeah. I've seen what he could do on national television against Indianapolis, okay? He was making some catches that I was like, damn. Yeah. Um, yeah. This guy could be the real deal. Yeah, he's got all the talent in the world. I think give him a better uh, I- environment. I don't know. Give him more targets, I agree. Like, I don't know why he's not. They keep throwing to Deontay Johnson and and these guys, man. Throw it to Pickens and Pat Fryer move. Um, we've seen one on one. Pickens is going to catch that ball if it's thrown correctly. He's one of those guys where you can throw it up even when he's covered, and you trust him. Either he's going to come down with the ball, or nobody is. Right? Absolutely, man. That uh, he he could be very special. Yeah, I think he will be. He reminds me a lot of DK Metcalf. He's not quite as big as DK, but give him a couple years in the league, he might be right. Yeah, absolutely. How about tight rookie tight end Connor Hayward out of Michigan State? I loved him with the Spartans. He gets drafted to the Steelers. Sixth round pick. Great value pick. And he records his first career touchdown catch. A pretty nice catch in this game. Uh, I know you've seen Connor Hayward uh, at Michigan State. Nice to see him having some success in the NFL. He's one of those do-it-all fullback tight end. You know, he can he can really do it all. Yeah, and you know. I did watch a lot of them, you know, because I watch a lot of college football. But anyway, yeah, um, I think he's going to be a solid player, and that's a nice guy to have behind Pat F- Pat Fryer move too. Yeah, he's the brother of defensive end Cam Hayward on the Steelers, and they're both the sons of Ironhead Hayward, a star back in the day. Nice. Um, so the Falcons fall to five and eight. Um. They're not technically eliminated, but I'm not really banking on the Falcons. The Steelers will host the 8-4 and four Ravens, and Lamar Jackson unlikely to play. Is this a game the Steelers can win? No, because I like Tyler Huntley a lot. Ugh, I don't know, man. 
I like Tyler Huntley. I think the Steelers win this game. Ooh. Because the Ravens are Lamar Jackson, bro. You can like Tyler Huntley. He's not Lamar Jackson. And even the Broncos almost beat him when Lamar went out. I think the Steelers might win that. And the Steelers are playing a little bit better ball than I thought they would be. Yeah, but to me, I mean, Tyler Huntley, in my opinion, would be a decently solid starter anywhere in the NFL. Uh, I don't know about that. Maybe eventually. I don't think he's ready to be an NFL starter yet. He's a good backup. But we'll, I mean, think about it like this. Last year, Lamar goes out. Tyler Huntley steps in. He got a lot of praise, but really, how many games did they win? They were leading the AFC, and Tyler Huntley couldn't do enough to get him into the playoffs. Yeah, did they go like four and three or something like that? No, they were eight and three. I think they went under five hundred. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, he ended up with like a winning record of four and four or something. Yeah, but I mean, uh, I don't know. I'm not. I don't think we know quite exactly what Tyler Huntley is. He'll get a good opportunity. I mean, there isn't a better rivalry in football than Raven Steelers. So that's going to be a great game. It's going to be hard fought. I, I just like the Steelers to pull it out. We'll see. I'll give Tyler Huntley a lot of praise if he can get it done. Yeah, that'd be a big win. Absolutely. Um, And then the 3-8 and eight Broncos at the 7-4 and four Ravens. We were just talking about this. Lamar Jackson injures his knee and is week to week. Luckily, it's not season ending. Um, so they hope to get him back soon. A scary sight for Ravens fans, though, huh? Yeah, I agree, man. That's a big loss. Um, I mean, it was, back the, back. it was the exact same time as last year. Same record, same spot in the season when Lamar got hurt last year. And that's one of the big talking points on Lamar is staying healthy, right? Mm-hmm. Being a run-first quarterback and staying healthy. And that's always the, the tough, you know, tough play whether it be Jalen Hurts, Josh Allen, Justin Fields, if you're run first or you run a lot, you put yourself at a lot more injury risk. Yep. The Broncos led this game 9-3 to three in the fourth quarter. It looked like finally the Broncos were going to get a win. You know, with Lamar out, it's like, go, you know, get a win. You're you're better than 3-8, and eight, Broncos, but they can't. As the Ravens take a 10-9 to nine lead with 28 seconds left, Broncos kicker Brandon McManus tries a 63-yard field goal, but he misses it. Uh, Man, the Broncos are 3-9. and Talk about an absolute train wreck of a season for Denver, huh? Yeah, and it's disappointing because, as you point out, they have the talent to be way better. Absolutely. You got Russell Wilson, Cortland Sutton, Jerry Judy. You know, it sucks they lost Javante Williams, but... You got Latavius Murray, you know. The Broncos should be better than this. Not even talking about the offense. How about the defense, man, with Browner and guys like that balling out? Yeah, yeah, you would expect more, right? Yeah. I I mean, like I said last week, I put it all on Nathaniel Hackett, whether that's fair or not. Hackett's the fall guy. He'll get fired this offseason. And we'll see if they do better next year with a better, you know, a, a better fit for a head coach. But, man, I, it couldn't go much worse for Nathaniel Hackett, huh? His rookie, his head coaching debut, and he's going to – that's going to leave a bad taste in a lot of people's mouths. Yeah. Um, it's going to be hard to come back from something like that. I mean, Josh McDaniel did it, right? Yeah, you can go be an offensive coordinator again for a few years and put in, you know, Josh McDaniels had to do it at a high level for quite a while to get another shot. So yeah. we'll see what happens with Nathaniel Hackett. But tough year in Denver. Uh, big win for the Ravens. You lose Lamar, yet you still find a way to get a win. I just don't think that's sustainable. That's why I think they lose in Pittsburgh next week. And they need to get Lamar back as soon as possible because the Bengals are playing some damn good football right now and right on their tails, you know? Yeah, the Bengals are a dangerous team, man. And we're going to talk more about the Bengals coming up. Um, 
the Chiefs should be able to get a, a good win in mile high against the three and nine Broncos. So the Chiefs should be able to get back on the winning side and get to ten and three in week fourteen. Um let's go Packers at Bears. Big game, always a great game. The best, you know, the oldest rivalry in the NFL. Uh, Bears actually jump out to a 16 to 3 first half lead, but the Packers rally to win 28 to 19, and the and Green Bay completes the sweep of the Bears. Man, I'm tired of hearing that. I'm tired of seeing it. I'm tired of hearing it. I'm tired of talking about it. Um, you know, the Bears, even when the Bears have a quarterback and have an offense that can put up some points, now it's the defense that can't stop a nosebleed, you know. Yeah, and that's unfortunate because Justin Fields most of the time do, tries to do what he can over on the other side. Yeah, I mean, it's so frustrating. You know what I talked about all offseason, right? The lack of talent in Chicago and and continuously throwing the ball to guys like Equinamia St. Brown. And it's just like, man, you're not going to win that way. And Fields, it's frustrating because Fields is getting a lot of blame by some Bears fans are saying, we don't know if he's a thrower, calling him a running back, saying he's a run first and you can't win that way. It's like, man, give this guy some legit receiving threats and watch him put, you know, put up the numbers. In this game, he had a few deep balls down the field that were caught, um, but the weapons just aren't there, you know. It's very frustrating in Chicago. Yeah, and to be fair, he's a thrower. I mean, he showed that at Ohio State. If you put talent around him, he's going to be good. I mean, he had a Lave and, you know, yeah. Garrett. Yeah, Garrett Wilson. You know, just put put talent around him and he'll be fine. Yeah, and it's tough because sometimes it's an adjustment period to go from the NFL or from college to the NFL as well. So it doesn't always translate like that either. But um, I'm confident in fields. Um, I hope that we surround him with better talent. I remember – Bears Twitter trying to convince me that Equinamia St. Brown was a great ad. And, uh, you know, and then there's just not enough talent. Claypool, you know, we traded for Chase Claypool midseason, and he hasn't had the impact that we were hoping for. You know, it seems like he's still learning the offense and, and all that. Now we lose Mooney for the season. So it's just a frustrating year for Bears fans. And, um, uh, and the defense, man, it looks like we need a complete rebuild of the defense, you know? Yeah, I agree on that one. So everyone's talking about upgrading the offense, building around fields. Honestly, if we get the number two pick where we're slated right now, we're going to take that probably that defensive tackle out of Georgia, you know? We're going to have to address the defense in a major way. And so you wonder again what kind of weapons this field's going to have around them. So, and – and Carter's good, bro. Yeah, I want Carter. Um, Will Anderson's going to be in that same spot as well, at, you know, top three, top five, likely. Um, so I would take either of those guys. Um, but, yeah, it is worrying. I, I, I still feel like a lot of people are thinking that the Bears are going to be a lot better next year. I still think we're two, at least two years away. And it's frustrating because I felt like this rebuild wasn't necess necessary. You know, it was just a rebuild to rebuild. But um, big win for Green Bay. They, uh, they're they still alive, bro. You look at the Packers' schedule. I'll pull it up here. They improved to 5-8 and eight going into their bye. They can take some positive momentum into the bye. Um, are they on a winning streak? No, they lost to Philly. So they get a win. They go into their bye. You look at their schedule coming out of the bye. At home against the Rams, at the Dolphins, home against the Vikings, home against the Lions. Honestly, I don't see why the Packers can't win three out of four. And if they can find a way to win in Miami, they might win all four, you know? Yeah, I agree. I mean, is winning those four enough to get them in, though? Well, if they're five and eight, they'd have to be. They'd be nine and eight. They can't afford another loss, so they have to sweep. They have to win all four of their remaining games. Every game's a playoff game, and uh, 
even then they might not make the playoff. So their backs are up against it. Uh, I don't know if they'll be able to go into Miami and win, you know. But Rams should be a win. Home against the Vikings, you know, uh, December football in Lambeau, you never know. And home against the Lions, that's winnable games, so we'll see. Um, Christian Watson combines for 94 yards and two touchdowns. A.J. Dillon, 119 yards and a touchdown. So we'll see. The Packers not quite out of it yet, right? Yeah, I agree, man. They just have to have a couple big weeks. Yeah, how about the Bears' 3-10 and 10 record? If we go back to the offseason, uh, people were hating on me for saying 6-11. and 11. But 3-10, and 10, I don't think, is a lot worse than any of us anticipated. You know, it's quite the, you know, bad season for the Bears. Yeah, are they even going to get to 6-11? and 11? No. Uh, the Bears are going to have a really bad record this year. Let's see, we're 3-10. and 10. Going to the bye, we're home against the Eagles, that's a loss. Home against the Bills, that's a loss. At the Lions might be the only win left. Um, I think we can go into Detroit and get a win and split the series. If we don't, then we won't. You know, 3-14 and 14 is might happen to this team. 4-13, and 13, I think, is our ceiling at this point. Wait, you're telling me you got the Eagles and Bills back-to-back? Yep. Ooh, that's brutal. Yeah, two two games where we're gonna get beat like fifty to ten. That's brutal. Yeah. So uh it's good for the tank, but bad for the eyes if you're a Bears fan. Um let's go to the next game here. Let's go to Jags at Lions, a battle of two four and seven teams in Detroit. The Lions really came out ready to go. They jumped out to a 23 to 6 halftime lead and ended up blowing the Jags out 40 to 14. Um Trevor Lawrence avoids major injury. Did you see that hit that Trevor Lawrence took? Yeah, I did. And thank goodness it it wasn't worse than what it was. Man, it looked like a knee, you know? It looked like your typical ACL tear, you know? Yep. And so we're glad that he didn't suffer that. And he was able to come back in the game, but the Jags weren't competitive at all, get blown out. Um, Jared Goff, 300-plus yards, two touchdowns, no turnovers. Good game from DeAndre Swift, 111 yards and a touchdown. And Amon Ross St. Brown, 11 catches, 114 yards and two touchdowns. The Lions improved a 5-7. and seven. But I think that's where the optimism on this team is going to go away a little bit because they're going to start losing some games here to finish the season. Um, um, huh? You know, I think they could pull out two more at least. So they're five and seven. They're playing, they're hosting the Vikings on Sunday. Are you ready for my guarantee of the weekend? What's that? The Vikings are going to go into Detroit and get a win and sweep the Lions. So there's a loss. Lions at Jets week 15. That's a tough game. I think the Jets win that. I think Zach Wilson plays, and I think the Jets win that. Lions at Panthers. There's a win. Lions can beat the Panthers. Bears at Lions. That's winnable. The Lions might win that. But and then Lions at Packers, I doubt they win that. So I think you're looking at six or seven wins from the Lions this year. And I, I, I'll give them six wins, but I don't think they're a seven-win team. Five and seven is better than I thought they would be, but I think they go six and 11. What do you think? Um, Like I said, two more wins. So I'd say seven and ten. I mean, 7-10 and 10 would be a good season for them. It would be better than I anticipated. I thought they were a 5-12 and 12 team. So they've been competitive in a lot of games. I'll give them credit for that. Yeah, and, and I think Dan Campbell's building something. He is, but again, this is a long build. This is a long rebuild. I don't think they're as close as people think. You know, as much as I've been killing Jared Goff, he's actually been doing a pretty good job. 
of late. You know, not turning the ball over and spreading the ball around, getting a Monroe St. Brown the ball. But there's going to be an adjustment period when they draft their quarterback probably this offseason, you know, and and whoever they draft is going to develop and, and get into his game. So I think they're another year or two away still. Absolutely. So, you know, Lions fans have to be patient. They're going to be, you know, shouting for playoffs next off, you know, this coming off season, just like they were last off season, but I don't think it's coming in, you know, I'll give it two, two to three years still. The Jags fall to four and eight. I thought the Jags were going to be better this year. At least, I don't know. Did you think the Jags would be better this year than four and eight? I, I did, man, because I thought Peterson would have had them playing a little bit better football. Yeah, maybe there's still a lack of talent, you know. I mean, we both believe Trevor Lawrence is the guy. Uh, they got Travis Etienne, you know, uh, Christian Kirk, um, guys like that, but it's just not leading to wins, you know, that many wins right now. And it's frustrating when your team like the Jags can beat the Colts when the Colts are fully healthy and feeling like they can contend in the division. And then you go and get blown out by the Lions. You know, it's I'm I am gonna put some b- blame on Doug Peterson because how are you? Do you not have your team ready to go against the Lions? Right? Yeah, um, absolutely. But you know, uh, they're in a small rebuild and they'll get better. And Trevor Lawrence will continue to improve. Also, you know, I don't know. It's been a he took a couple of years off, so I I let my uh, issues with him go, but I'm being reminded of again, I'm not a huge Doug Peterson guy. And uh, I know he won a Super Bowl with the Eagles, but that was St. Nick Foles carrying that team on his shoulder. I don't know that I trust, I don't know that Doug Peterson's going to be the guy that turns Jacksonville around. I like the hire, man. I really do. Um, all the experience he has, I mean, head coach, offensive coordinator, you know. Well, he's a major upgrade over Urban Meyer. But yeah. I think, you know, I would like to see Trevor Lawrence with someone like Byron Leftwich or Eric Bieniemy, A young mm-hmm. guy, you know? Yeah. So we'll see. 10-2 um, and two Vikings at the 5-7 and seven Lions. Lions are at home. Are you taking Detroit? Ooh, I'm not going to just because I think the Vikings are playing some pretty good ball. Yeah. You know, Dalvin Cook, Madison, Justin Jefferson, Cousins is doing his thing. I got the Vikings as well. The 4-8 and eight Jags at the 7-5 and five Titans. Titans, a uh, couple bad losses. I think they rebound and get a big win in the division against Jacksonville. Do you agree? I do. And um, it's pretty interesting. Titans – aren't doing too bad and they fire their GM. Yeah. Um, we were going to talk. Let's see. Where is that one? That's up here a little bit further. Where's the Titans at on here? Oh, yeah, that's coming up here. We'll talk about that here in a second. Yeah, the, I'm surprised by that too. And it sounds like some in the building are surprised by it as well. Um what real quick? What's your thought on that division? Because your Colts were supposed to. This was supposed to be the year that your Colts got the job done and won the division. Um, the Titans lose Julio Jones and AJ Brown, yet they're still on pace, looking like they're going to win the division. How do you see that division going uh, next year and in the future? Are the Titans running that division for a while, or I mean? You know, your Colts were supposed to steal it, but it's looking like, you know, I don't know. What do you think? Well, I mean, I'm going to say this right now. In Indy, we're going to go through a complete rebuild. Yeah, it's looking that way, but you got Jonathan Taylor, right? You got Alec Pierce. You got Shaq Leonard. We do. We do, but the thing is, we're going to have to have Matt Ryan for one more year because, I mean, at first they got rid of that contract, then that would put us in a hole. Yeah. Not saying Matt Ryan is terrible. I just think unless we improve the offensive line, we're going to be in trouble. 
Yeah, and how did that offensive line go, diminish, get so badly, so quick? It used to be the strength of the team. Uh, losing a lot of guys. I mean, we lost Eric Fisher. We we lost Mark Glowinski. Yeah. You know, guys like that inside yeah. also with Quentin Nelson. You know, those were some pretty – those two names were pretty good guys over there on the O line. Yeah. So we'll see. I mean, uh, it's gonna be some adjustment period for indie fans and for that division. So good on the Titans taking care of business. I think they get to eight and five and likely a home playoff game. So we'll see what they can do. If they can win a playoff game. Last year they got beat by the Bengals uh, in a frustrating end of the season. Let's go Browns at Texans. The, the the Deshaun Watson return to the NFL. We haven't seen Watson play quarterback in damn near two years. Um, starts for the four and seven Browns at a really bad Texans team, and the Texans actually are leading five to nothing in the first half. But Houston ends up pulling away, or Cleveland ends up pulling away to win twenty seven to fourteen. Um. Deshaun Watson struggled in his debut. He looked rusty, which, you know, I anticipated that. It's going to happen. But the team, the Browns aren't a bad team, are they? I mean, they're competitive. And you give them a quarterback like Deshaun, and uh, they start playing with some life, right? You know? Yeah. I, and, I mean, they didn't. They weren't terrible when Brissett was starting, but I just think that, you know, uh, Watson just adds more of the ability to almost guarantee that you win more games. Yeah, credit to Jacoby Brissett. He did his job keeping him afloat. And then Watson gives him that upside. I mean, a fully healthy Watson and a team built around him with a full training camp to get ready, there's no reason this Browns team shouldn't be playoff caliber, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, man, if, if Deshaun – comes out and plays, you know, and is Deshaun Watson of old, Cleveland might be a little dangerous, Alex. Yeah, in the future. Uh, I doubt this year, you know, um, but next year, absolutely. Um, they're going to be competitive for the rest of this year. And how about this? I mean, the offense doesn't even score any touchdowns. They put up 27 points, and all the touchdowns come on defense and special teams. You had a Donovan Peoples-Jones punt return for touchdown. And then you had two defensive scores, one from Denzel Ward and one from t linebacker Tony Fields. So the Browns look like a pretty complete team, you know? Yeah, and that defense has always been good. Yeah, when you're anchored by Miles Garrett and uh, and then you've got other pieces, Denzel Ward I've always liked, and, you know, they've got some weapons for sure. What, Greedy Williams, right? Yeah. Um. So I don't understand why teams do this. Tell me what you what you think of this. So they the Texans benched Davis Mills. We disagreed with it at the time. They put in Kyle Allen. He struggles, throws two interceptions in this game. Lovey Smith today announced Davis Mills is going to return to the starting lineup. He'll start week 14. Do you think this was just a, trying to send a message to Davis Mills, similar to what the Jets are doing? I mean – you know, it's clear to us and most that Kyle Allen and Mike White aren't starters in this league, you know? Yeah, and I think it was Lovey just trying to see what he had. Yeah. You like know, like winning even with Davis, so let's see if Kyle can provide a spark. Yeah, yeah. and at that point, I'm going back to Davis myself. Yeah. Uh, the Texans, I mean, talk about a shit season. One and ten and one is their record. That's terrible looking. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they go to Dallas, so that should be an easy win for the Cowboys, even with Davis Mills starting. How about Deshaun Watson and the five and seven Browns at Joe Burrow and the eight and four Bengals? I believe that this will be Deshaun Watson and Joe Burrow the first time ever that they're facing each other. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, and, uh, the, you know, the beginning of a long uh, rivalry probably between the Browns and Bengals and Deshaun and Joe Burrow. 
How do you see the opening game going? Do you think the Bengals get the win at home? I do. Um, for the simple fact that I think that the Bengals are super hot right now. Yeah, they're playing some really good football. I mean, again, it doesn't necessarily translate week to week. You know, the Bengals seem to have the Chiefs number. They've beaten them three straight times now. Um, does that carry over? Like, I think they beat the Browns, but keep an eye on this game. This game, I think, will be really close. I think it's going to be a hard-fought game. And, it, I mean, especially late in the year, Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt really wears on teams, you know? Yep. Um, so, yeah, let's go to Vikings-Jets. The 7-4 and four Jets at the 9-2 and two Vikings. You know, going into this game, I was telling people, like, look, don't buy the hype on Mike White. He had a good game against the Bears. It's not going to happen today. Uh, the Vikings led 20-3 to at halftime, or in the first half, so it looked like everything was going according to script for me. But the Jets actually fought back and had two opportunities to take the lead and just couldn't get it done. The Vikings hang on to win 27-22. Did you see Braxton Berrios? You know, what should have been the game winning or go ahead touchdown late, and he just it just hit the ground. Yeah, tough, tough break there. You got to catch that if you're Barrios. Yes, you do. Um, and that's <laughs> often what NFL games come down to minor little details here or there. And that's unusual because Barrios is usually one of them guys that you can count on to, to make that kind of play. Yeah, he's usually got great hands. Um, Good win for the Vikings to get to 10-2. and two. I mean, Mike White throws for 350-plus yards, but zero touchdowns, two interceptions. Do you know the name Zonovan Knight, the running back? Um, I have heard of him. I just can't remember where he came from. Out of NC State. Ah, oh, okay, yeah. Undrafted rookie running back Zonovan Knight. He's getting the, mo the most uh, touches. He combines for 118 yards in this game. Wow. Nice. So, yeah, not bad. A, a name to keep an eye on, Zonovan Knight. Um, good game from Garrett Wilson. Eight catches for 162 yards. I was going to ask you this. I think we already got the answer. Who do you think gives the Jets the best chance to win, Mike White or Zach Wilson? Zach Wilson. Yeah, so let's make the move back. I would make it. You got a big game coming up in Buffalo. I would make it for this game. It sounds like they're going to keep going with Mike White. If they lose this game, I think you got to go back to Zach Wilson, right? Mm-hmm, for sure. And then big game, Vikings-Lions, you know, division rivalry throughout the records. Those are always fun to watch. Let's go. So this is where it gets fun. The 7-5 and five Commanders at the 7-4 and four Giants. The first of two meetings in three weeks. Um, because they played on Sunday and they'll play two weeks from now. Um, the Commanders jump out to a 10 nothing first quarter lead. The Giants rally to tie the game at 13 all at halftime. It goes into overtime at 20 to 20, and no one can score. Uh, the Giants try a 58 yard field goal as time expires and missed it, and we end in a tie. This was one of my favorite games of the weekend. Uh, I love the, the NFC East rivalries. And these are, you know, a tie is fitting because these are very two very evenly matched teams. Don't you agree? Yes, I do. Um, yeah, I agree with that statement completely. Yeah, I mean, their records are very similar and their play on the field is very similar. They tie 20 to 20. <laughs> um, who do you think they play in two weeks? Who do you, who do you think it'll be in Washington D.C.? Who do you think wins that? Oh, it's going to be a big one. It's good, and it's been flexed to Sunday Night Football. By the way, ooh, that's going to be some fun football to watch. Yeah, you know what? Alex, I am going to go with the New York Giants. Really on the road? Yes. Give me the Washington Commanders. Remember what I was saying when the Giants were 3-0, and right? Yep. You said that said, you didn't believe that they were – you basically called them frauds. Kind of. 
and not as bad as the Cardinals, but I said that they're in a tough division and they might miss the playoffs. And if – so you're picking the Giants to win. I think the winner of that game, Giants-Commanders on Sunday Night Football, I think the winner likely makes the playoff and the loser doesn't. I mean, you you know, you can't afford losses at this time of the year, you know? Yep, I and agree. Especially in division, and the winner of that game wins that series between the two teams. Plus, the Commanders are on a bye, so they get an extra week to prepare for that game. The Giants don't. They have to host the Eagles on on Sunday. Oh, man. Yeah. So it'll be I, probably identical records, both teams 7-5-1. and five and one. I mean, do you see any shot the Giants beat the Eagles in New York? <laughs> man, I don't because the Eagles are playing very good ball. My gut, so mentally, I was just assuming the Giants are going to lose that. But honestly, looking at it right now, I mean, you're talking division rivalry in New York. The Giants might win that game. Ooh. Okay. They might. Because I keep looking for, and I've made the, a couple picks. Eagles fans can tell you that I've been picking against them recently. And I got one right. I got their first loss right. The Eagles aren't going to go 16-1. and one. They're going to lose somewhere along the way. Why not in New York? Yeah. So, but I'm going to keep an eye on, huh? So that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, but we'll see. Uh, Eagles will be favored, likely, and, and should win. So, we'll see what happens there. 7-4 uh, and four tit- Titans at the 10-1 and one Eagles. Game was tied 7-7 seven to seven in the first half, but the Eagles pull away for the blowout win, 35-10. to 10. Um, Jalen Hurts combined, or throws for 350-plus yards, three touchdowns, no turnovers. Do you think, is A.J. Brown the best receiver in the game, in your opinion, or no? Ooh, there's a lot, man. There are. Top three. I mean, who would you put? Justin Jefferson? Jefferson, Adams, A.J. Brown. What about Devontae Adams? Yeah. Are you Devontae Jefferson. Adams? Uh, what about um, who's the other guy? Jamar Chase. Oh, he's just been injured. So that's yeah. why I don't have him there right now. And then what about DeAndre Hopkins? His suspension. I mean, you can't he's, hold it against him, but yeah. When he plays all 17 games, he's he's probably the best if you want to consider hands-wise. Yeah, like D-Hop, in my opinion, is right there with the best in the game. But mentally, we don't associate him there because he hasn't played much recently, right? Yep. So, and availability is your best ability. But how about A.J. Brown in this game? First of all, the NFL was going crazy and the media was going crazy about that touchdown catch where he plowed over dude and then no one was guarding him and he had the easiest touchdown in the world, right? You saw that? Yep. How the fuck is that not offensive pass interference? I couldn't tell you, bro, man. There's been a lot of me. You're telling me you can just plow over a de- defensive back and it, we're all good. Play on. Are you kidding me? Are you not surprised? I'm very surprised. I mean, it's the NFL, but I didn't think you could go that far with it. And let let me play a, a little game here. Let's imagine that a receiver is going on a route and gets plowed over like that by a defensive back. Any chance it's not flagged? Ooh. But a receiver does it, and oh, we're all good. Come on. Yeah. I love A.J. Brown. He's a monster. But that was obvious offensive pass interference. You got to throw the flag there. Come on. What are we doing, NFL? I agree. Um, Derrick Henry, part of the reason the Eagles get this blowout win, everyone's going to fall in love with Earth and A.J. Brown. You know why the Eagles won this game? Do you know? Henry struggled. Derrick Henry held to just a combined 38 yards. 
man. That's how you beat the Titans right there. And it helps to get out to a lead early, and then the Titans have to throw the ball a lot late. And I think they pulled their starters even at some point because it was such a blowout. But still, you got to get more production than that out of Derrick Henry, right? Absolutely. He's your he's your best player. Yeah, your workhorse offensive player. Um, Eagles are clearly Super Bowl contenders at, at uh, 11 and 1. My question to you, Dustin, is are they the favorite? Yeah, I would have to say they are. To what? To win it or in the NFC to go? Um, They have to be a favorite to come out of the NFC. Yeah. And home field would be huge. I keep saying it. No one is want, going to want to go into Philly in January, especially with A.J. Brown and, and having to tackle Jalen Hurts on the run, right? Mm-hmm. Um, we talked about this briefly. The Titans fire GM John Robinson despite being seven and five. Shocking move. And head coach Mike Brabel was asked about it, and he said he was not consulted on the decision. What do you think of that? Yeah, it's crazy to me. I mean, you have a winning season. You made it to the playoffs last year. Is there something that we don't know about? I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, obviously there has to be. There has to be something between the owner and the GM or something. Um, but Mike Vrabel, when you say something like that, it sounds like Vrabel wasn't a fan of the move. So we'll see. The, um, yeah, be interesting. See what the Titans do going forward. Let's go Seahawks at Rams. The six and five Seahawks at the three and eight Rams. Seahawks uh, win a back and forth game as Geno Smith throws a game winning touchdown pass to DK Metcalf in the final seconds. Metcalf was being defended by Jalen Ramsey, but you know the good defense doesn't do enough, and DK makes the catch. I mean that's the thing about guys like DK Metcalf and AJ Brown. You can put the best corners in football on them. I'm still I still like my chances, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, man, how about Gino, bro? Yeah, Gino doing his thing. He throws for 350-plus yards and three touchdowns. Uh, big win. Kenneth Walker goes down with an injury, and the Seahawks still get a win. So, good job on them. Yep, I agree. Um, Tyler Lockett and DK Metcalf combined for 17 catches for 255 yards and two touchdowns. Big games out of those guys. How about defensive end Uchenna and Wosu records two sacks this season? He's got a career high nine sacks and three forced fumbles. Big year out of Wosu. Yeah, um, man, they've they've been playing well. Yep. The good news: Kenneth Walker suffers a foot injury, but it's not a big deal. He's gonna try to play next week. The Seahawks are gonna need him if they're gonna do anything, right? Yeah, and man, he's he's a baller, bro. Yeah, I I'm loving. You know, I'm obviously gonna be a fan out of Michigan State, but he's at you know transitioning to the NFL game very well. And I mean, even non Michigan State fans like myself, I love his game. Yeah, he's like a, you know, he runs behind his pads and, and delivers a hit. You know. Yeah, he reminds me of you know exactly like. Guys like a Nick Chubb, you know, I mean, somebody who will just lower the shoulder and, and just will straight run you over. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Can you hear that? No. Fucking car horn going off. About to kick someone in their wiener. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Rams quarterback John Wolford combines for 200-plus yards, zero touchdowns, two picks. Cam Akers, 60 yards rushing, two touchdowns. Bobby Wagner records two stacks against his old team. I remember Bobby Wagner when I was in Seattle hearing him talk about how he couldn't wait to go up against his former team. He gets two sacks. You know, he can still do it, get it done when he needs to. Yeah. And Wagner was a beast in Seattle. Yeah. And then how about this? We talked about it briefly. Baker Mayfield. Uh, gets claimed by the Rams. The Panthers waive him, 
and the Rams claim him. And someone said there's a chance Baker Mayfield could start Thursday night. Wow, already? Yeah, they said there's a chance. I doubt it, but I would like to see it, you know? Yeah, I was going to say, it's going to take a minute for him to learn that playbook. Yeah. Um, What did you think of the move, uh, the Rams claiming Baker Mayfield? Yeah, um, it came as a little bit of a surprise to me. Just because of where they end with their record and stuff, I thought they were just going to finish it out and, you know, be like, oh, well, we're, what, 3-10 and 10 right now, 3-9? and 3-9, and nine, and it's like, why wouldn't you just tank the rest of the season and get a high pick, right? Yeah, and, you know, but I can understand. Well, do you know why I think they did it? Uh, you, see, you see this sometimes in sports. I mean, who's the Rams' biggest rival? It's the 49ers. The 49ers. And they didn't want Baker Mayfield to fall to the 49ers. So they, you know, for the hell of it, they put in their waiver claim to block that, I think. Yeah, which would have been crazy, man. And I yeah. definitely that the Niners should have popped in there and got him. Well, they couldn't. You know, it goes by waivers and you're who's got the higher waiver. And so the Rams had the automatic um, if they wanted them. But, yeah, I was hoping that to see Baker go to the Niners. But there's some good news on the Niners. We'll talk about that in a few. Um, so, yeah, Thursday night football this week, tomorrow night, the 5-7 and seven Raiders at the 3-9 and nine Rams. The Raiders are on a three-game winning streak. Don't look now. Three-game winning streak for the Vegas Raiders. At the 3-9 and nine Rams, a pretty winnable game. Can the Raiders continue their winning ways? I do. Um, I think that, that the Rams are done. I don't, I don't even know if they're even going to – I don't want to say try, but, you know, I don't think they have any reason to want to even go in that game and work hard to win it. Yeah, I think they're going to try. But the Raiders are the better team. Devontae Adams and Derek Carr have found some chemistry recently and are playing better football. And then how about Josh Jacobs has been absolutely balling out. You know, ever since that one game where he went for over 300 yards, um, so, and they got confidence. You know, just when we had the Raiders dead and buried, here comes a winning streak, right? Yeah, for sure. So I got the Raiders winning on Thursday night. Sounds like you do too. The 4-8 and eight Panthers at the 7-5 and five Seahawks, another opportunity for Seattle at home. They could get to 8-5. and five. Who would have thought? That the Seahawks would be eight and five right now, you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I thought once they lost Wilson, bro, I thought they were going to be done. Yeah, it's one of those where the narrative completely flipped. You know, I was right there with you. I thought that Geno Smith and Drew Locke are both backup quality quarterbacks and it's never going to work. And the offense was bad with Russell Wilson, so it's just going to get worse. But to his credit, Geno Smith, I mean, we like to talk about Marcus Mariota. The real story is Geno Smith, right? Yeah, absolutely. And would you would you agree that this might be the best coaching job that Pete Carroll's done in Seattle? Well, it, we don't know yet. It's a great job. He's doing he's he's overachieving for sure. He's got them headed for the playoffs. But let's wait and see. The real question for how good of a job it is comes late in the year, right? Can you make the playoff? Can you potentially win the division? They're only what? You know, they're not far off. They're right there with the Niners. And Jimmy G just got hurt. So maybe the Seahawks can win that division. And then can you win a playoff game or two? You know, you never know. And that that's when the narrative is going to be written, right? We don't remember teams – you know, having good regular season. We remember what they do in the playoffs, right? Yep. So that'll be the big test. Let's go to one of the biggest games of the weekend, the 8-3 and three Dolphins at the 7-4 and four 49ers. And this game started about as poorly for the Niners as it possibly could. The first play of the game, Tua passes to Trent Sherfield, who's a former Niner, and he takes it 75 yards for a touchdown. 
So one play and the Dolphins are up 7 nothing, And then the Niners opening drive, Jimmy Garoppolo gets hurt. Like, worst case scenario, I made my pick and I had trolls on Twitter saying this aged poorly, you know, after like one possession. Huh. And, it, you know, it looked bad. The Dolphins are up 7 nothing, and Garoppolo's out. But credit to the Niners, you know, uh, they stood tall. Man, that 49ers defense is nasty, isn't it? Yeah, man. And that, that to me, is what's going to keep – everybody's like, Niners are done, Niners are done. I disagree because I think that's what's going to keep them in these ball games enough to win until Jimmy G comes back. It's not just the defense either. You know Kyle Shanahan's going to figure out a way to get some easy plays on offense, get some points. And you look, they got talent. And uh, to his credit, man, Brock Purdy, Mr. Irrelevant, the last pick in the in 2022 draft out of, what, Iowa State, right? Yeah. Man, he came in, and honestly, he played pretty well. There was a couple times where he had pressure a blitz right in his face, and he converted like a third and ten. Yeah, and um, I like Brock Purdy, man. I watched him his whole five years. I mean, what seemed like ten, but it was five mm-hmm. years when he was at Iowa State, and he and he was always what kept that team either nine and three, eight and four, you know, mid pack. So he's yeah. not a bad. No, I mean, you just don't expect to see that out of a seventh-round pick, out of Mr. Irrelevant. I mean, they say Mr. Irrelevant because, you you know, our podcast has probably never mentioned a Mr. Irrelevant guy before in its history. You know, this is this is uh, groundbreaking stuff right here for our podcast. Yeah. and But to his credit, it doesn't matter where he was drafted. He took the opportunity and beat a good Dolphins team. You know, I mean, the Dolphins are no slouch on either side of the ball. They got playmakers. He threw one interception to Xavier Howard. But other than that, he throws two touchdown passes. Christian McCaffrey, a good game, 141 yards and a touchdown. Uh, And that defense, man, that defense is so nasty. We talk about Nick Bosa records three sacks and a forced fumble. And linebacker DJ Greenlaw steps up, recovers that fumble, and takes it for a touchdown. Those guys are dogs, man. Yeah. um, Like I said, they are a dangerous dark horse to win the whole thing, in my opinion. I agree. And good news for the Niners. Since you brought it up, I'm going to say this part. Uh, It came out, I believe, yesterday. Or today, Jimmy G did not break his foot. Kyle Shanahan post game said he broke his foot. Came out today, he did not break his foot, and he did not suffer a Liz Frank injury. So he doesn't need surgery, and he could return in seven to eight weeks. Guess when that is? The playoffs. Just in time for the playoffs. So what is the injury then? I'm kind of confused. If, if he didn't break anything, why is he out for so long? I'm not sure either. They didn't say. They didn't disclose what it is. They just say it's a foot injury, and it's going to take some time to heal. But I don't really care what it is. As long as he's good to go in time for the playoffs, I said it today on Twitter, I can almost guarantee you Jimmy G will be ready to go. Once the playoffs start, he'll he'll suit up. He'll take all the time he needs to get that foot as close to 100% as possible, and then he'll be ready to go come playoffs, you know? Yep, and guess what? Jimmy G is a winner. Yeah, and it, he doesn't have to carry the load. This team is so loaded on on all three phases. It's like, bro, just just get us there. You know, you got a kicker that's never missed a playoff kick. You know what I mean? Yep. So, um, how big of a loss is this for the Dolphins? Um, they were on a hot streak, a five-game winning streak coming in. Jimmy G goes down. This is a game you should expect the Dolphins to win if they're contenders, right? Yeah. You know, what What do you think happened? Oh, man, I just think, you know, it's the 49ers are, are good. Tua through two interceptions. Is Tua part of the issue? Like, is, 
is Tua, does he uh I mean he he beat the Bills, right? Earlier in the year, but yeah. Tua's not the Tua just had a bad game. I, he and he didn't really have that bad of a game. I, he he had his moments where he struggled, especially late. I mean, to me, two picks, you know, we have different lookouts on bad games. To me, two picks is a bad game. He might have had I thought he had a fumble loss in there too. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> so, um, and here's a key stat because Mike McDaniel comes from the Kyle Shanahan offense and he brought in what Raheem Mostert and what Jeff, uh, what's his name? That other running back. He brought in uh, two running backs, huh? Yeah, I know who you're talking about. I'm trying to think of the name myself, Jeff Wilson. Ah, uh, yes. Um, so he brought in two Niner running backs, you know, so it looks like he's going to run that same, like, zone run game that the Niners do. The Dolphins were held to just 33 yards rushing in that game. Yeah. So if you're the Niners defense, and that's got to be the goal, right? If you can make any team one-dimensional, if you can take away their run game and force them to pass, 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 then you can unload guys like Nick Bosa can pin their ears back and Greenlaw and Fred Warner and these dogs and get after the quarterback, right? And that forces turnovers. Yeah, bro. And, man, how does Shanahan just – he's known for such an offensive mind, but how does he continuously just keep having these, these defenses that are just great? Well, that's a great segue. Because you know who should be the hottest head coaching candidate in the National Football League right now? I mean, Sean Payton, but who should be number two? Uh, I'm going to say, is it Eric Bieniemy? Nope. 49ers defensive coordinator, D'Amico Ryans. Oh, yeah, D'Amico Ryans. Okay. Yes. 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 If Ryan. anyone needs a head coach, he should be number one. I'm telling you, D'Amico Ryans deserves an opportunity. This defense is nasty. And and he's doing a great job. And who's your – so right now I think it's a two-headed race for Defensive Player of the Year. Would you vote Nick Bosa or Micah Parsons? Ooh, ooh that's a tough one there. Yeah, I know who my pick is. You know what, man? This year I'm going to go with Micah Parsons. Okay, my vote is Nick Bosa, but the stats, he's he's got a slight edge in stats, but there can be a, a debate made for either. I mean, you, you really can't go wrong either way. Yeah. Um. So, prediction time for Alex. If you go back to when Brian Flores was the coach of the Dolphins the past two years, what's a good word to describe mm-hmm. The Dolphins under Brian Flores. Uh, playoff team? Close. I would say streaky. Remember, they would start one and seven and then go seven and one. You know, they, they're a streaky team, right? Yeah. Yep. Even this year with Mike McDaniel, remember they started three and oh, then they went three and three, then they went eight and three, right? Streaky. Yep. The Dolphins are about to start a losing streak. Ooh, I disagree with you on that one. Well, let's break it down real quick. Let's look at the upcoming schedule. The Dolphins have their five-game winning streak snapped at San Francisco. Do you know who their next two opponents are? I do not, but I can look if you if you would like me to. I got it. I got it right here. Sunday night football has been flexed. Week 14. Dolphins at Chargers on Sunday Night Football. Ooh, Dolphins, Chargers. Oh, yeah, give me Dolphins. Give me the Chargers. And then week 15, the Dolphins at the Buffalo Bills. Ooh, yeah, give me Bills on that one, but that still only takes them to five losses. And after that, they had the Bills already out of the way. You know, I think they can run the table after that. 
I don't see an easy win remaining on this schedule, bro. I don't. Uh, they got exposed to the Niners. I mean, my post was at this loss. You got beat by double digits by a backup quarterback. Like, a bad loss to the Niners. It should have been more competitive than that. And then they go to the Chargers, give me the Chargers on Sunday Night Football. And they go to the Bills, give me the Bills. That's going to be a three-game losing streak for the Dolphins, in my opinion. Oh, I don't think that bad, bro. All right. And then they're home against the Packers. Every game's a playoff game for the Packers. And if the Packers come in on a winning streak, that'll be a tough game, you know? Yep. It's your boy, Aaron Rodgers. You think he can't put up a fight against Miami? Oh, they play the pack. Okay. Yep. And then at New England in Foxborough late December. Never easy. Mm. Patriots could win that, and then they're home against the Jets. So we'll see how the season ends. You know, the Dolphins are, what's their record right now? Um, eight and four. Eight and four. If they lose to the Chargers and Bills, they'll be eight and six. So, you know, that's the thing that I like about the NFL so much is that you only play 17 games. So – Wins and losses, you know, a couple losses, a couple wins can change your outlook in a hurry. The Dolphins were leading the AFC East before Sunday. A couple losses could bring this team back down to earth real quick. Um, my question to you is this. Is the Dolphins making the playoffs a sure thing? I think it is. Yeah. But... I think the second – in the division, and second in the AFC East would, I mean, it would have to be like, what, maybe they 11-6? and six? I think that gets you in. Yeah. What about 10-7? and seven? Does that get you in? That's close. Yeah. I think that's where they'll be. If I'm going to make a prediction, I'm going to say 10-7. and seven. And uh, – they can still get in. I think they would get in as a wild card, a six or a seven seed. But that's a far different outlook from where they were just a week ago on a five-game winning streak, right? And number one in the division, you know? Yep. So a lot can change in a couple weeks. Just something to keep an eye on. Um, yeah, Dolphins at Chargers, they flex that game to Sunday night. You know, the media, national media is so hyped for Tua against Herbert. Are you? Yeah, uh, Tua, Herbert, man, that's going to be a good game. Who's the better quarterback, in my opinion? I think it's Herbert, but Tua well, just had. And I'm not as hype about that game. Like, the national media loves it. That's the two guys that they've crowned. I'm not that hyped for it. I mean, the Chargers, I don't think, being frankly honest with you, I don't think the Chargers are that good of a team. Do you? Uh, I don't. The media keeps hyping this Chargers team to no end, and they keep missing the damn playoffs. Like, why do we keep hyping teams that miss the playoffs every year? Oh, because they got our beloved Justin Herbert. Make the playoffs, then we can crown his ass. Uh, he's still a pretty good quarterback, bro. Yeah, well, I'd like to see a good quarterback make the playoffs. I'm just I mean, saying. I agree, but, you know, he's – He's got talent. <laughs> How about this matchup? The six and six Bucks at the eight and four 49ers. Ooh. Really good game. But Brock <laughs> Purdy likely to start. Give me the Bucks. Ooh. That's a fight. Ooh, that's gonna be a fire game. Yes, it is. It's gonna Ooh. be a fire game. And the, the the big matchup is the Bucks offense has kind of been struggling, right? I mean you know, it, they had three points up until the very end of that Saints game. So they're going up against the best defense in football. That's a true test for Tom Brady, huh? Yeah, but, man, as as we've seen on Monday night, you need to have 50 points in the fourth quarter to to be even beat that man. <laughs> um, Give me the Bucks against Brock Purdy. I think Purdy's naturally going to come back down to earth a little bit. That's a tough game, and the Bucks need it more, in my opinion. So, uh, what's your pick on that? Bucks at Niners. 
Man, that's a hard pick. That is a really hard pick, Alex. Yeah, it's uh, a tough game. Let me go Bucks. All right. Yeah, tough one to pick for sure. Um, another good one. AFC Championship game rematch. The Chiefs at the Bengals on Sunday. I knew it was going to be a great game. It always is. And the Bengals have won two straight. So it's a big prove-it game for Patrick Mahomes, right? Everyone crowned Patrick Mahomes the next great quarterback. But here comes young Joe Burrow and played a big role in keeping Mahomes out of a Super Bowl, you know? Last yeah. year, everyone expected the, the, the Chiefs to make the Super Bowl, and Burrow kept them out. So naturally, I felt like Mahomes and Andy Reid are going to have something for the Bengals this, this time. Um, but the Bengals jump out to a 14 to three lead. The Chiefs rally to take a 24 17 lead late third quarter, but the Bengals get the win 27 24 to win their third straight game over the Chiefs. First of all, what are your thoughts when I say that the Bengals three straight wins over the Chiefs? Yeah, that's that's a crazy stat. Um, you know, Burrow is uh, Burrow's the guy, though, man. If there's anybody who can compete in game for game with Patrick Mahomes, it's definitely Joe Burrow. Joe Burrow, to me, he has his ups and downs. But to me, he seems like one of those big game quarterbacks, right? When the lights are at their brightest, Joe Burrow seems to play his best football. Absolutely, man. He's a baller. Yeah, and he seems to have a little chip on his shoulder against Mahomes, too. Like... I don't know what it is. He plays his absolute best football against the Chiefs. I mean, did you see a couple of the throws where Burrow purposefully takes a little heat off the ball and hits it underneath right in the perfect window for touchdowns? Like, the dude has really high IQ. Not just all the arm talent in the world, but he knows when to make certain throws, right? Yep. And I love Joe Burrow going back to LSU. I mean, remember, he out Trevor Lawrence in the national championship game, remember? Yeah, that was – and not only did he outdo do him, but he he did pretty damn good. Yeah. So, um, Burrow throws for 300-plus yards, three touchdowns, no turnovers. You know, the Bengals are have no Joe Mixon. He's been out with injury. But Samaj P. Ryan, one of the best backups in the league, c comes in and combines for 155 yards. I like Samaj P. Ryan a lot. Do you? Yeah, Samaj is good. He's, uh... I mean, I'll, go, I'll go as far to say this. You're not going to like this, but we were talking a couple weeks ago about running backs that take over Jamal Williams. Give me Samaj P. Ryan. <laughs> yeah, bro. Um, He's a good player. I mean, yeah. have guys, though. 155 yards uh, combined. Jamar Chase, seven catches, 97 yards, and his return from injury. Um, you know, Harrison Butker, the Chiefs kicker, usually pretty damn reliable, misses a 55-yard field goal late that would have tied the game. Do you see that? Yep. But uh, is, also, go ahead. Which is unusual for a guy like Harrison Butker. Yeah, it is. We've seen him make big kicks in the playoffs. But uh, um, also a big drop by Bengals receiver Tyler Boyd. He had a wide open touchdown and just dropped it. Yeah, you can't do those kind of things. So KC with that loss falls out of the one seed and the Bills now have it. You know, we can't talk about this enough, how big of a deal home field advantage is going to be in the AFC, whether you have to go to Buffalo or go to Arrowhead, right? Yep. I mean, which which do you think would be a scarier environment for an opponent? In Buffalo in the snow or in Arrowhead in the loud noise and Mahomes and Josh Allen? Oh, that, that that's another hard one, too, because they're not exactly quiet in Orchard Park. Yeah. yeah the but, best pick there is, can I play in neither? <laughs> at the end of the day, I would not want to go to Arrowhead at all. Yeah, exactly. And and to his credit, man, that's what was so impressive last year that Joe Burrow went into Arrowhead and got that win, right? Oh, yeah. Um, 
But that just goes to show you how important it is. I talk about it every year, how important home field advantage is in the playoff. Um, yeah, very important. I mean, I thought that last year when 49ers went to Lambeau, but I was wrong. But that's the thing, man. It's like it's very important, and sometimes – I mean, Lambeau should have been the perfect environment for Green Bay to get a win. It's just sometimes that just shows you how good a team is to be able to go on the road and win in the playoffs, you know? Yep, absolutely. Um, let's go Chargers at Raiders. The 6-5 and five Chargers at the 4-7 and seven Raiders. I picked the Raiders to win this game because I'm not sold on the Chargers. And, you know, there's, they're too inconsistent for me, and they – they don't seem like a playoff team to me. They seem like a talented team that just can't get it done. The Raiders are, you know, come in on a two-game winning streak. They the Chargers actually jump out to a 10-0 first half lead, but the Raiders pull away in the second half. Impressive win, 27 to 20 over the Chargers. Derek Carr does his thing, Josh Jacobs does his thing, and Devontae Adams, 177 yards receiving and two touchdowns. Um, you're starting to see the Raiders click on all cylinders. Three straight wins, a massive win here. You know, the Raiders hit that seven losses, and it's like, all right, now it's playoff game every time, and they're on a three-game winning streak. Are you ready to bury the Raiders, or do you think they have life left in them? <laughs> That's another good question. Man, you're hitting me with some hard ones tonight, Alex. Uh <laughs> You know, I mean, yeah. Do they have the ability to, you know, have a major turnaround? Absolutely. Will they? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. Remember last year, though. Remember they fired John Gruden and Rich Basaccia took over as the interim. And remember they went on that crazy win streak just to make the playoffs. Yep. So anything's possible, you know. And this team. You talk about streaky teams. The Raiders are a streaky team. And they play the Rams on Thursday night. No reason to think they can't win that and get the four straight wins. And then you're damn close to 500. Yeah. And, I mean, you know, last year, though, I just feel like they wanted to play for Rich. You know, they he, he took over, and it was a whole different football team. Yeah. Um. Here's something hot, a hot take that I want to say to you or get your your take, your reaction to it. Uh, the Raiders are on a three-game winning streak, and let's look at their upcoming schedule, all right? Yep. They play the Rams on Thursday night. That should get them the four straight wins. You can't look past the Rams, but if you show up, you should be able to get that win. That would get you to six and seven. Week 15. The Raiders host the Patriots. Winnable game, right? Yep, for sure. So if they can get win that, then they'll be on a five-game winning streak and get to seven and seven. Week 16, they play at the Pittsburgh Steelers. Winnable though, right? Yep. Winnable. They could get to eight and seven there. Week six, week 17, they host the 49ers. Who could be again without Jimmy G? Oh yeah. And then week eighteen, this could be the game that really decides whether they make the playoffs or not. They play. They are at home against the Kansas City Chiefs. Oh yeah, that's uh, that like you said could be the game that comes down to the uh, deciding factor. I just want to throw a what-if scenario at you. Okay. Let's say the Raiders went out. Let's, I mean, uh, you know, crazier things have happened. You get on a four- or five-game winning streak, you can build that momentum and keep rolling. What if the Raiders, after starting the season two and seven, go into the playoffs on an eight-game winning streak? Oh, I mean, you know. Any team that's hot like that, and we've seen it before, for example, the Niners have done it, the New yeah. York have done it, you know. Yeah. It, it's it's hard telling where you can go 
being hot at the moment. And if you're firing on all cylinders, that Raiders offense could be dangerous. Absolutely. And I'm rooting for it because you remember my take in the offseason, right? I was really high on this Raiders team. And at 2-7, and seven, they disappointed me so much. But now that they're on a roll, man, I'm rooting for this team like crazy. Yep, absolutely. Um, so let's get back to uh, this here. Um, how about the Chargers? A, a great opportunity to beat a really, a, you know, relatively bad Raiders team, the way they've been playing. Um, if you're a playoff team, shouldn't you win this game? Shouldn't you get this win and get to 7-5? and five? I mean – didn't they lose the Seahawks last week? Yes. No, the Raiders did. Uh, the Chargers. Who did they play last week? The Chargers. Um, I swear, I just seen it. Yeah, I'm looking. Uh, they 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 beat the Cardinals, but barely. Yes. Okay, that's what it was. And they've lost, they lost to the Seahawks a couple weeks ago. But, man, I don't trust this Chargers team at all. Do you? No, and it's unfortunate. Oh, excuse me. It, it's unfortunate because, man, they have the talent. I mean, on paper, they're one of the most talented teams in the National Football League. Bro, I feel like I could go on Madden with this Chargers team and win the Super Bowl. You know, they got Justin Herbert, Keenan Allen, Mike Williams, Austin Eckler. Uh, Gerald Everett is a hell of a tight end. Khalil Mack, Joey Bosa, weapons everywhere, right? Yes. And just, you know, they can win some games, but they can't win others. They're just too inconsistent. And uh, I can't pick this team to win anything right now, man. I don't trust them at all. Mm -hmm. Um, Should head coach Brandon Staley be on the hot seat? In your opinion, I'd say one more year. No, man. If they miss the playoffs again, I mean, do you th- is that saying that they're going to make the playoffs or miss it? I think that they miss it, but Bro, I just if they miss the playoffs again, he's got to go. In my opinion, I mean that's what we think, but I don't think LA is going to do it yet. They'll be idiots because, in my opinion, the biggest reason the Chargers are losing a lot of these games, bingo, falls right on the head coach, Brandon Staley. He manages the game like a 13-year-old Madden player. And it's reckless. It's irresponsible. You've got all the talent in the world on your roster, and you can't even make the playoffs. You got to go. I trust the Raiders right now a lot more than I trust the Chargers. And that's saying a lot, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. How about this? We haven't mentioned his name all season, and for good reason. Raiders defensive end Chandler Jones records three sacks on Sunday to beat the Chargers. Trivia time for you, Dustin. How many sacks does Chandler Jones have after the three sacks on Sunday? How many does he have on the season? Oh, man. Uh, I'm going to go with five. Less. Oh, so three then. Three and a half. Okay. So he had half a sack before. (laughs) Wow, so he's kind of having a struggling year. He is, but we all know he's a great uh, pass rusher. It's just one of those years or something, you know? Yeah, and we've seen it with some of the best, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And this was, again, remember last week we talked about it. No one on the Raiders had more than one sack other than Max Crosby. So finally Chandler Jones steps in, right? Yeah, and man, Crosby's a beast. Yep. Um, Let's go Sunday night real quick to talk about your team. The 4-7-1 and seven and one Colts at the 8-3 and three Cowboys. This was a great game up until the fourth quarter. I believe it was a two-point game going to the fourth, right? Okay, do we got to talk about this game? Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> um, I mean, the Colts led 10-7 to in the first half. It was a close game going into the fourth. I mean, the Colts didn't play as badly as the score indicates. 
they played a decent game. It just got away from them in the second half. Um, Cowboys blow them out 54 to 19. But I mean, you agree the Colts played better than the score indicates, right? Uh, in the first half. What what was it? What were what like? What pissed you off the most about the game? What's the issue with this team? Why did they lose that game? Turnovers. What's the issue? I mean, shoot. Where where should I start? I mean, you had Jonathan Taylor about to break away for a long run, bro. That could have been six, but he gets tripped up and he fumbles the ball. Yeah. And then you have Mo Ali Cox as you're moving to try to actually go score a touchdown to take the lead, he fumbles. And it gets returned for a touchdown. Yeah, and it's like, oh, my, you guys are shooting yourselves in the foot. Yeah. You don't – they don't suck. They're just not doing something right. And to me, it's every game – I mean, we've seen it with Pittsburgh. Jonathan Taylor and Matt Ryan messed up that snap, and guess what? It got fumbled. It gave Pittsburgh the ball. Yeah. It's it's knucklehead plays. And I tell you what, as a fan, bro, it's annoying. Yeah, and- I mean, it's been issues all season long. We talk about all the time the slow starts, you know, putting up three and zero in the first half. And then when you do get out to good starts, another thing that's plagued this team is turnovers. And, you know, Matt Ryan came back after getting benched and was turnover free for like a couple games. And then Sunday night on national TV, four turnovers, you know? Yeah, it's – we're just – it's just been that type of year. We need – it comes down to coaching, man. I mean, if you you don't have your guys prepared, they're going to play sloppy football. And that's how it is. You know, I love Jeff Saturday, but if this is the long-term plan, I'm not for it, and I'm being honest with you. Yeah, I mean, so you talked about rebuild, and I think Jeff Saturday is a good guy for a rebuild, in my opinion. I would keep him. You can pay him a low, low-end low salary for a head coach since he's young, never done it before, and rebuild around him and suck in the process, right? I mean, do you want to do something like that? So I see what your point is, Alex, but we need somebody with experience. We need somebody who – who is going to come in and and put their foot down and not just be like, oh, okay, you know, this is happening. No, we need a guy who's going to come in there and have authority. Do you you think that they made the wrong decision and should have gone with Gus Bradley? I do. Yeah. I do. Just because of, look, you could bring Saturday on on the staff. That's no problem with me. As a matter of fact, hire him as the O line coach, because yeah. yeah, or even as a just to like, you know, what do you call it? Uh, just to help out, he doesn't have to be the head coach. I agree. Or if you were gonna, you know, you should have Gus Bradley, in my opinion, as the one calling the plays. Yeah, you know, because he's a former head coach, he knows what to do in certain situations. I mean. Man, even against that defense of the Cowboys, Jonathan Taylor was still getting four or five yards of pop at a time, and then you go away from it. It's like, come yeah. on. Yeah, I know. It's way too often. I don't know why the Colts keep going away from Jonathan Taylor. And uh, the frustrating part to me, and it's got to be so frustrating to you, is that it's like the same issues that you were having with Frank Reich are happening with Jeff Saturday. And at some mm-hmm. point, you start to wonder – Is it a franchise issue more than an individual head coach, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, I mean, this is going to be a long offseason. I think it's time for Chris Ballard. He's got to go, you know. Um, It ultimately runs through the GM, too, you know. And just – it's bad right now, Alex. And, to be honest, I don't see us winning another game. Yeah, I mean, the Colts will be competitive. I mean, but, yeah, it's one of those years, and it might be better off, might be beneficial to lose out. You know, why not bench Matt Ryan at this point now that you're officially damn near eliminated 
and uh, you know, tank the rest of the season out. You can go four twelve and one, um, or you can keep fighting and try to go eight and eight and one. But I just don't, you know, that's not going to get you into the playoffs. So why even bother, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so frustrating year. I I understand it. I mean, you know. You couldn't foresee all these things happening. A tough year for Indy, you know. Um, I never thought Frank Reich was the right guy, but Matt Ryan was the fall guy for no reason. And, you know, it just came undone. But, you know, those seasons happen and just kind of retool, rebuild, whatever you got to do and turn this thing around. Jim Ursay is part of the problem. I agree. He's a little too hands-on of an owner, but you'd rather have, a hands-on owner than an owner that doesn't know what the fuck they're doing. Yeah, and I mean, like, it's... But even our best players, the owner can't control, like, Michael Pittman Jr. being wide open on a slant and getting the ball right to his chest and dropping it. Yeah. It comes down to coaching and and having your players ready to go. And if Pittman's going to continue to do shit like that, then move on. You know, Alec Pierce looks like a solid guy right now a solid future weapon if Pittman won't get it done you know um I like Pittman I think he's a good receiver I mean some of the shit you just can't I don't know I mean Taylor fumbling you know it's like that's one of the best backs in the game you know sometimes shit just happens too yep so um let's go Monday night the Saints the four and eight Saints at the five and six bucks you know, it's a bad division, but still there's pressure on Tampa Bay to start winning. You know, you can't fall to five and seven and let these bad teams hang around. You need to start playing some better football. And for three and a half or three and three quarters of the game, the Saints dominated. It was 16 to three Saints. The Bucks couldn't do anything on offense. You know, they couldn't stop the Saints and get the Saints off the field either and um with five minutes and 30 seconds left the bucks they wanted to go for it on fourth and ten you could tell brady was trying to send the punt team back and uh uh what's their head coach todd bowles right yep bowles sent the punt team out there he overruled brady which kudos to him smart move and said no we're gonna punt it and i agree smart move there were some people on twitter saying you know, that was an absolute stupid move by the head coach. It comes down to how much time is left on the clock. And uh, you don't want it all to come down to a fourth and ten. So you punt the ball, you play defense. The Bucks defense steps up. They they force the Saints to go three and out. How about running back Mark Ingram running out of bounds uh, one yard short of the first down? Yeah, that's I've seen that. That's uh, crazy. That's one of the biggest keys to why the Bucks came back to win that game. Mm-hmm. If Mark Ingram is a veteran running back, he has to know better than that, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he's been in the league now for, what, eight years? Yeah. And it's not even running out of bounds is the number one thing that's wrong with that. The clock's running down. You have to keep the ball inbound. And then to run out short of the first down, he knew it right away and and put his hands on his head like, what did I just do? But, man, you can't do that. Inexcusable nope. mistake by Ingram. You got to have better awareness than that. I remember as a Bears fan, I remember when uh, not the Adrian Peterson – or was it Adrian Peterson? No, it was – It, it was, was Marion other- Barber. It was Marion Barber ran out oh. of bounds and cost us a win against the Tim Tebow Broncos. Yeah. Rest in peace, by the way, Marion Barber. Yeah, that's not a shout at you, Marion. You were a hell of a running back. R.I.P. Uh, but so Mark Ingram starts it, right, by going out of <clears throat> out of bounds. That allows the Bucks to force a three and out. So they get the ball right back. Brady marches down, touchdown, with plenty of time left, about three and a half minutes left. Right then and there, you could feel the momentum start to swing, right? Yes. You know, Brady hadn't scored a touchdown the entire game. Me and Josh are watching it, and I'm like, all you got to do is go score two touchdowns here. You got Tom Brady. And Josh kind of laughs and is like, well, they haven't done it all game. 
They're just going to magically do it now. And then here he goes. He goes down, scores. So now you got to play defense. They kick it deep, and they force another three and out. And I don't know what Dennis, Dennis Allen was doing, dropping Andy Dalton back, and he takes a big sack on second down and pretty much makes it easy, you know, third and long then. I don't know what Dennis Allen was doing trying to throw the ball there. Do you? I don't – yeah, I mean, you probably shouldn't throw the ball – at any time during that last drive, unless you, you know, at least, at least run the ball twice, and then uh, if you want to throw it on third down, go for it. But not on second down, I don't think. No, it, especially when you should know that that they're going to bring the heat, and that's exactly what they did. Yeah, absolutely. So they go three and out. How about I forgot about this until rewatching the highlights. That third and long, Andy Dalton hits Taysom Hill in the hands, but a great defensive play knocks the ball loose. It would have been a first down and a killer for the Bucks, and would have probably ended the game. But the Bucks defense did a great job of hitting Taysom Hill as he caught it and knocking the ball loose. Yeah, good play. Um, yeah, I, I mean Brady is going to get all the love for this comeback win, but the Bucks defense played a huge role in it too. Absolutely. And so they force another three and out, you know, perfect scenario. Three and out, touchdown, three and out. You get the ball back to Brady with more than two minutes left. That's a recipe for disaster. And it, even with a couple penalties along the way, Brady marches down, throws the game-winning touchdown with, like, you know, just a couple of seconds left in the game. If you were the Saints, wouldn't you have been calling time out there to leave some time on the clock just in case Brady scores? Yes, but, man, that game management by, by Brady was almost perfect. Yes. I mean, look, you leave it up to Tom Brady, and he's going to rip your heart out. This is what Tom Brady has done his entire career. I couldn't stand it when it happened on the Patriots. I hated those Patriots, bro. And uh, Brady would always do this. and. Uh, now he's doing it in Tampa, and if you're Dennis Allen and the Saints, you allow him to do it, he's going to kill you. You have to be smarter, and Dennis Allen really kind of fucked up a, a few times there at the end of the game, in my opinion. Yeah, yep, he sure did, and I mean, you know, he's learning too, so. Yeah, well, we'll talk a little bit more about Dennis Allen here in a few, but um, I posted, I mean, I said, that, was there any doubt? I mean, Tom Brady, you know, the defense did its job and gave Brady two opportunities to go win it. Uh, that's Tom Brady, right? Isn't that – that's the GOAT, right? I mean, come on now. Yes. I mean, he finds a way to do this. And the, it's, it's not even the fact – if Tom Brady did this in his prime at age 28, we would be going nuts. The fact that he did this at age 45 – is absolutely insane. We can't even understand right now how big of a deal this is, I don't think. Well, that's why when you're playing him, you have to take every single point that you can get. Yeah. Yep. And that's crazy to say that one football player, one man can change the outcome in a snap of a finger. Yes, and he is one of the guys that can do that. Um, we, I always say how hard it is to win in this game. And I don't say it based on me. I've heard it from NFL head coaches and GMs and and owners that and players, star players. That's, I, I repeat what they have said. Uh, it's so hard to win in this league. And when you're playing against Tom Brady, you damn near have to play perfect. I mean, ask Kyle Shanahan about it with the Falcons in the Super Bowl, right? Yeah, absolutely. And look, I've never seen eye to eye with Brady, you know, obviously. But one thing I have to say is I have never seen a, an athlete because I didn't really grow up with the Jordan, you know, era in the NBA. Yep. yep. But I have never seen a player. And I am glad that I'm witnessing it like somebody with the will to just want to win. Like, you cannot take the killer instinct out of that man. Like, well, you can see it in his face, right? When he's doing that, when he's coming back, look at his face. It's it's scary. Like, you, he knows exactly what he's doing. 
You know, he's been there a thousand times, and he knows that if he does what he's supposed to do, he's gonna win. And I'm and sure he, he he pulls his defense aside and been like, "Look, guys, just give me the chance to yep. to be able to get the ball back, and I, I I can almost guarantee you we will walk out of here with a W." Well, imagine being a defense, a defense or a defender on Tom Brady's team. You know, if you do your job and give him a chance, you never know what was capable of happening, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but, man, where does he get that killer instinct from, bro? Like, Certain players have it, um, and they're that's special. Fair. I mean, you got to see some of it through Kobe. Yes. You know? Kobe had that. I think Jordan had it to an extreme level. The, there's only two guys that I put on the same – I mean, Kobe was damn close, but there's only two other guys I put on the same par as Michael Jordan. Tom Brady, and can you name the other one? Well, I, I'll just tell you, Tiger Woods. I, yep, Tiger Woods. I was just about to say that. That killer instinct, they give you that look. That You see that look late in the game, late in the match, and you just know – they're going to find a way to win, and they're going to do something crazy while they're doing it. I mean, so I was watching this one golf tournament with Tiger Woods in his prime, late late career, but in his prime, and he's in the sand, and he has to hit this shot. He hits it out of the sand straight into the cup for the win. Jeez. It's like, bro, that's the fucking goat right there. <laughs> like, I don't need to see anything else. That's the goat. Yeah. So, and I um, mean, you could put Serena in that category in a way. Yeah, versus her competition, who she's faced, the most dominant female tennis player of all time, right? Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I, that's why we love sports is to watch these athletes that can turn it on and do shit that is almost we can't even understand, you know? Yep. Um. So a big win for the Bucks to get to six and six, a massive win, you know, in their division. It puts them a, a full, like, what, two games, two and a half games up in the division now. Um, they got a big game in San Francisco. But, you know, as long as the Bucks take care of business, win the division, get a home playoff game, we've been saying it all year, nobody wants to face Tom Brady and the Bucks in the playoffs, right? No, absolutely not. So it's going to be interesting. Big game against the Niners. I think the Bucks go into San Francisco, get a big win. We'll see. The Saints go into their bye at four and nine. And in my opinion, it's fire Dennis Allen time. Um, the, you know, do you know that this is not Dennis Allen's first time as head coach? Uh, see, that's where I had thought that he this was his, his first time. So I made that mistake. Yeah, he was actually a head coach with the Raiders back in the day. Dennis Allen has coached in 49 games as a head coach. Guess what his record is? How many oh. wins in 49? Now that you say that, I do remember. Yeah, with the Raiders. Yes. How many wins in 49 games as head coach for Dennis Allen? Ooh, how many wins? Um... I'm going to say less than 12. 12. Oh, okay. I was close. Yep. Hell of a pick, uh, guess. 12 and 37 is his NFL head coaching record. So what made them think he was a good candidate in the first place? He was the defensive coordinator under Sean Payton. Yeah, but, in, you know, if you go back to – I still think that they could have opened it up and found somebody who. Oh, absolutely. They hired the wrong guy. Yeah, clearly. Um, they should have hired somebody else, but they didn't. And so now they got to deal with it. I still don't understand why Jameis Winston isn't playing. That has confused me the entire season. Yeah, I've been thinking all season long that, that he's hurt or something. That's why I've been wondering, like, where the hell Jameis has been. Any head coach in football that chooses Andy Dalton or Jameis Winston over Jameis Winston, I'm going to question their IQ, their football IQ. Is Jameis healthy? Yes, he is. 
Wow. Newsflash, Dennis Allen. This isn't 2014 anymore. Yeah, th- that's kind of weird. Yeah. So, yeah, my my friend Chris Rosvoglu, who uh, covers the Saints, is, okay. you know, bitching about uh, Andy Dalton and Dennis Allen. And it's such a tough year for Saints fans. So. Yeah, it's a tough year for <laughs> a lot of us fans, man. That's why we love the NFL, though, man. It's like it's either so enjoyable or it's so frustrating, but we're still going to watch every single game, right? Yep. So good shit as always, man. I mean, hell of an episode. So much to talk about. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, thanks, man. Just we're getting down there. Hey, uh, we're just got to get to the month of December and then it's playoff time. Yeah, I mean, we're here. We're in December, my favorite time of the year, my favorite month. I mean, December, then January. January is my favorite. And, uh, you know, I can't wait to see how this all unfolds. Do the Raiders stay hot? Do the Bucks, you know, make the playoffs like they should? You know, I mean, a lot of different questions. What happens in the AFC East? Do the Dolphins make the playoffs? Do the Chargers make the playoffs? Um, who gets fired? All these questions we have. I need to be asked. I mean, how about the Ravens and Bengals? Who wins that division? How quickly can Lamar get back? And then what happens to those teams in the playoffs, you know? Yeah, and who's the who's the team that doesn't have a winning record right now that gets in, you know? Yeah, and uh, keep an eye on those Raiders. Keep an eye on them. Um, so, you know, we're going to have to get Pablo back on the show soon as well to talk about his Ravens. but. Um, Awesome shit as always, man. Appreciate the support to all the fans. Don't forget to like, subscribe, leave a comment. Let us know what you think. Have a great week, guys. And peace out.